Good evening. Yep. I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Jones Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy here at the Kennedy School of Government. And I want to welcome you to this very happy evening. This is a very happy evening for the Shorenstein Center, one of the true high points of our year. As some of you know, and some may not, the Shorenstein Center was created nearly 20 years ago as a memorial to Joan Shorenstein, a superb television journalist who died of breast cancer far too young. Her father, Walter Shorenstein, endowed the center as a place for a focused and searching examination of the intersection of the press, politics, and public policy. Walter Shorenstein not only made the center possible, but he has remained vitally interested in what we do and has been our unstinting supporter and friend. He's here tonight, and I ask that you join me in recognizing his great contribution. By the way, Walter celebrated his 90th birthday earlier this year at a party which required taking over the entire Four Seasons restaurant in New York for a night. It was a great party. And uh, if anything, I would say that as he looks forward to his 100th birthday party, he is only picking up steam. A bit later, you will hear from Peter Beinert, our distinguished Theodore White lecturer for 2005. But first, I have another task to perform, which is an honor, but a bittersweet one. Nearly a year ago, we at the Shorenstein Center lost a great and much admired friend, David Nyan, who died unexpectedly in January after he came inside to take a break from shoveling snow. Many of you knew David well, but some of you did not, and I want to speak about him as we this year inaugurate the first annual David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism. David Nyan was a man of many parts, devoted family man, beloved friend, always boon companion. He was a big, handsome man with a killer Irish smile who had that rare power to light up a room just by walking in. I've seen him do it many, many times when he was a fellow at the Shorenstein Center. But tonight we honor David Nyan, the consummate reporter and political journalist which was the role that occupied much of his life and at which he could not be bested. David was a reporter and then a columnist at the Boston Globe and his work had both a theme and a character. The theme was almost always power, especially political power, and also especially the abuse of political power by the big shots at the expense of the little guys. He loved politics. And he also loved politicians. As a group, he respected them. He felt they were often themselves given a raw deal and judged by a standard that was smug and sanctimonious, two things David Nyan never was. For David, politics was the way things got done or the reason things didn't get done. He was a reporter's reporter when it came to rooting out what really happened, the aspect of a political story that really interested him. And he especially loved being able to debunk the popular wisdom. He was an aficionado of hypocrisy and cant. And at the same time, he was the first person to defend a beleaguered politician whose crime was that he was human rather than that he was corrupt. But if politics was the theme of David's work, the character of that work was a mixture of courage and righteous anger leavened by a great sense of humor and the ability to write like a dream. He relished a good, meaning a bad, fight with a political figure or perspective. He had a knack of seeing beyond the surface issues and the baloney to the heart of things and especially to the reality of what was going on. He was a self-avowed liberal and utterly non-defensive about it. I can tell you that if he were here with us tonight, no one would be watching the White House leak investigation with its promise of perp walks tomorrow with more delight or with more shrewdness. As a columnist at the Globe, he was a battler and an old holds barred advocate, but he was also 
always surprising his readers with his take on things because most of all, David Nyan was his own man and he called them as he saw them. In his memory and honor, the Nyan family and many friends and admirers of David Nyan have endowed the David Nyan Prize for political journalism to recognize the kind of gutsy, stylish, and relentless journalism that embodied David Nyan. On the back of your program, you will see a list of people who have contributed to the Nyan Prize endowment. And I was just handed this right before the program tonight. It feels like a nice packet of cash. And on it, it says, it's a wonderful and very fitting tribute to Dave and hopefully it will inspire many political journalists to live up to Dave's high standards. Ted Kennedy. His wife, Olivia, his children, and many members of his family are here tonight, and I would ask them now all to please stand. This year, the David Nyan Prize for Political Journalism goes to David Willman of the Los Angeles Times. David Willman is without question one of the nation's premier investigative reporters. He started out covering politics at the city and county level in California and moved on to presidential conventions and campaigns. When I asked him to give me some idea of the work of which he was particularly proud, David cited interviews with Richard Nixon, George McGovern, and Eugene McCarthy is three of his favorites. He's a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize, first as a member of a team thrown into the breach to cover a disastrous earthquake, and second, in 2001, for his own investigation into the Food and Drug Administration's very flawed drug approval process. In a series of articles that were both penetrating and devastating, he unmasked the corruption and flawed judgment involved with the FDA's approval of a drug for treating diabetes that proved to be so dangerous that it was withdrawn from the U.S. market. In his work, he then went after the FDA's disregard of safety risks in an exhaustively reported and documented special report entitled, How a New Policy Led to Seven Deadly Drugs. The series described how the FDA had changed its policy of caution consistent with the first do no harm physician's creed, which had been the way they had approached drug, drug approvals when considering new drugs. They changed it to something very different. In the 1990s, with the urging of the Clinton administration, the FDA began to treat drug manufacturers as, as the Clinton administration put it, partners, not adversaries. He then spelled out the calamity that followed in horrific detail. Eventually, all seven drugs were withdrawn but not before more than a thousand patients had died. Like David Nyan, David Willman speaks for the powerless to the powerful, representing people who most need an advocate and a strong, determined voice. In a series that I particularly like, and may strike some bells with some of you, David Willman revealed that the tunnel walls of the subways in downtown Los Angeles were less than half, less than half, the required thickness required, and California's public works contractor was forced to retrofit the structure at no cost to the public. Those of us who live with the aftermath of the big dig suspect that there may be some kinds of stories like that in our future as well. I think we could have, would agree that we could use a David Wellman in Boston. He is a two-time finalist for the Shorenstein Center's Award, the Goldsmith Prize for Investigative Reporting, which is given each spring for the best piece of investigative reporting, which has had a major impact on the public welfare. He now works from the Washington Bureau of the Los Angeles Times. I have no doubt whatsoever that David Nyan is nodding his enthusiastic approval. David Willman, please come forward to accept the first annual David Nyan Prize for Political Reporting. Thank you, Alex, for that generous introduction. Uh, I am sincerely honored to receive this award 
given in the memory of David Nyan. I'd like to thank Olivia Nyan and all of the Nyan family members, along with the Shorenstein Center here at Harvard, including Alex, Edith Holway, and Jessica Cole. Your efforts to improve, actually your efforts here, uh, help to improve our discourse, I hope our journalism. I'd also like to recognize the constant support that I've received over the years from my wife, Joan, and our children, Allison and Joseph. I'm just one reporter. I could not do what I do without the collaborative talents of my colleagues at the Los Angeles Times. Janet Lundblad, in particular, has provided invaluable research assistance for me. It's also great to see another colleague here tonight, Jack Nelson. I'm touched that both Jack and his wife, Barbara, uh, could make it. The national prominence of the LA Times is truly Jack's legacy. We've been through a lot of executives at the LA Times. Uh, you may have uh, heard about some of our issues and might be familiar with some of our challenges. At times, it's been uh, truly interesting. But I'd like now also to recognize my great fortune in stumbling into working for the man I consider to be the best editor in American journalism, and that is John Carroll. And rumor has it that uh, John is trying to sell his California hot tub and move to Harvard. Uh, Harvard will be the winner. In preparing to visit here tonight, uh, I spoke with some old friends from New England, and they impressed upon me how generous David Nyhan was to young reporters. And as a former young reporter, I can't tell you how important that is and how valued that is. They said that unfailingly, Dave was a champion of the underdog. I've never had the pleasure, I never did have the pleasure of meeting uh, Dave, but it struck me that my own sensibilities as a journalist were probably not too far from his. Simply put, it would be to report deeply, be the surrogate eyes and ears for those people who care, who lack access to power, remember always the little guy, let the voiceless be heard. Thank you very much. If you want to know what Dave Nyan's smile looked like, he's got two children here tonight that are just absolutely the living embodiment of it. Um, by the way, John Carroll is going to be here. He has accepted a position as a Shorenstein Fellow beginning in January, I'm very, very glad to say. Thank you, David. Theodore H. White was also a consummate reporter whose passion was politics. He came to Harvard on a Newsboy Scholarship and went on to a very distinguished career as a journalist and also a historian. Indeed, they, Teddy White, as he was universally known, changed both political journalism and politics when he wrote The Making of a President in 1960 about the Kennedy-Nixon campaign. For the first time, he raised the curtain on the sausage-making side of presidential campaigns and changed forever the candor and behind the scenes drama that is now at the heart of campaign coverage. He followed that first book with three more, Making of the President books in 64, 68, and 1972. No one has yet matched those smart and groundbreaking examinations of what happens and why in the maelstrom of a political campaign. And it is fair to say that Teddy White's heirs are the journalists of today who try to pierce the veil of politics to understand what is happening and to then analyze and deliver the goods to those of us who are trying to understand. Before his death in 1986, Teddy White was one of the architects of what became the Shorenstein Center. One of the first moves of Marvin Kalb, the center's founding director, was to establish the Theodore H. White Lecture on the press and politics in his honor. This year, the White Lecture is to be delivered by a young man who, despite his years, has already established himself as one of the freshest thinkers and most brilliant voices on the liberal side of the nation's political debate. Last year's White Lecture was, in fact, delivered by the person who we feel holds that title on the conservative side of the equation, Bill Kristol, editor of the Weekly Standard. More than once after last year's lecture, I heard expressed the sentiment from liberals in the audience 
that can be summarized as, why don't we have someone like him? Well, in fact, liberalism does have its own counterpart, counterpart to Bill Kristol, and I mean that very much as a compliment. Peter Beinert is the editor of The New Republic, and under his leadership, that magazine has emerged as the clarion voice of a new liberalism and has also kept faith with the best traditions of the old liberalism. Many of you are probably familiar with Peter from his TRB column in the magazine, as well as his work that has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and other such opinion-shaping vehicles. Those of you who have seen Peter in action know that he is witty, smart, aggressive, and most important, he has ideas. He has lots of ideas. The Week magazine named him columnist of the year in 2004, and he is a regular on the television talk circuit. But his most ambitious undertaking has been to dare what some have thought was impossible, to resurrect liberalism in a nation that seems to have decided that the word liberal is an epithet. Oddly enough, Peter Beinert is a 1993 graduate of that hotbed of conservatism, Yale University, where he won a Rhodes Scholarship and subsequently received a master's degree from University College, Oxford. Before he left for Britain, he spent a summer as a reporter researcher at the New Republic and returned after Oxford as the magazine's managing editor. Not bad for a first job. A few years later, he was named editor. He, in his writing, Peter has advocated a muscular liberalism, a liberalism that is unapologetic and unblinking, what he has called a fighting faith. He has expressed dismay that liberalism in recent years has almost always been largely framed as a negative, against the war in Iraq, against restrictions on civil liberties, against America's worsening reputation in the world. Enough, says Peter Beiner. His new book is entitled The Good Fight, Why Liberals and Only Liberals Can Win the War on Terror and Make America Great Again. His lecture tonight is New Media, Old Media, and the Future of Liberalism. It is my pleasure and honor to present the Theodore H. White Lecturer on Press and Politics, Peter Beinert. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank Alex Jones and Edie Holloway and the Shorenstein Center for inviting me here. It's a great pleasure to be back in Cambridge where I grew up and imbibed all those rustic heartland values for which the city is so rightly renowned. Um, and it's a particular privilege to be delivering a lecture named for Teddy White. After I was asked to give this lecture, a friend told me that the organizers had been slightly concerned about my age, but then they decided, well, perhaps I'd provide a fresh perspective. This is a mistake commonly made about the New Republic, a magazine written by 28-year-olds who think like 65-year-olds for an audience of 65-year-olds that wants to know how the younger generation thinks. <laughs> um, but I took the deba debate and decided to speak about the new liberal political culture emerging on the internet, except that soon after deciding that, I realized I have no particular expertise on this topic, never having written a blog myself and that I actually may be too old, too generationally out of touch to provide an answer. But then as I was rereading Teddy White, it hit me that he would have understood the blogs very well, that while they sometimes seem alien to me, they would have seemed quite familiar perhaps to him. Let me try to explain. Several months ago, uh, I was rereading Teddy White's The Making of the President, 1972, and I came upon his description of Eugene Picorni, the 25-year-old organizer for George McGovern's primary campaign in Wisconsin. Picorni clearly intrigued White, and what intrigued him was the young activist's combination of idealism, organizational brilliance, and intellectual parochialism. Picorni, White explained, was building a highly agile, a highly agile passionately devoted, virtually leaderless guerrilla army and with veiled analogies to Vietnam, White described how it snuck up on the heavy, clumsy, top-down campaigns of Edmund Muskie and Hubert Humphrey, and then ambushed them to win Wisconsin and ultimately the Democratic nomination itself. But Corny, White stressed, was no dreamer and no purist. He had no interest in lost causes. He was in it to win, and he was creating new ways to win. 
innovations that would transform the way presidential candidates were nominated. There was little innocence about Bacorny as an organizer, White wrote, as there was little innocence about McGovern's other Bacornys around the country. What innocence the McGovern guerrillas were to display would be political and historical, an ignorance about the outer world beyond the guerrilla theater in which they acted. When I read that sentence, I realized Teddy White would have had a lot to say about the emerging culture of the liberal blogosphere. In the making of the president in 1972, White chronicled a dramatic shift in power within the Democratic Party. In the minds of people like Eugene Picorni, the party insiders had been discredited. The big city bosses, the labor leaders, the veteran Pauls, first, of course, because they supported the war in Vietnam, but not only that, but because they had lost. They had gotten their man in 1968, Hubert Humphrey, even though the activists had wanted first Eugene McCarthy, then Robert Kennedy, then George McGovern himself. The insiders had pushed through Humphrey, who had supported a war the party grassroots loathed, and they had lost the presidency anyway. They had abandoned principle, and it hadn't even done them any good. I'm hoping this will sound at least vaguely familiar. Between 1968 and 1972, the party activists made sure that couldn't happen again. The Reform Commission, originally headed by McGovern himself, drastically overhauled the way the Democratic Party chose its nominees, making it impossible for local bosses to control city or state delegations, and then to throw them into a presidential candidate in a backroom deal. Instead, the process was opened up, with candidates forced to compete in primaries state by state. For old-style Pauls like Humphrey, accustomed to top-down campaigns where party leaders wielded enormous sway, this is a brave new world, and they couldn't adjust. For young organizers like Picorni, however, and McGovern's campaign manager, Gary Hart, who had helped write the new rules, the changes were a godsend, and they, brought, and they rode them all the way to the nomination. By the time the Democratic Party convened to nominate McGovern in Miami, it had been turned upside down. 225 of the 255 Democratic members of Congress had not been selected as delegates. Neither had the mayors of Boston, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, Detroit, and Philadelphia. Former New York Governor Averill Harriman had tried to become a delegate and been defeated by a 19-year-old college sophomore. Hope for some of you out there. What Picorni had helped engineer and what White chronicled was an historic shift of power inside the Democratic Party, from the inside out, from the insiders to the activists in the grassroots. Now fast forward two decades, not to today and the emerging liberal blogosphere, but to the late 1980s and early 1990s, when I came of age politically. When I was discovering politics and political journalism, there were no Gene Picornis. In fact, the Democratic Party was undergoing a reverse power shift from the outside in. By 1984, the liberal activist base that had taken control under McGovern seemed as exhausted and discredited as Hubert Humphrey must have seemed in 1972. And a group of insiders, particularly former Capitol Hill staffers for Southern and centrist Democrats, like Al Fromm and Will Marshall of the Democratic Leadership Council, began to move the power, began to move to limit the power that the activists wielded. First, they helped establish the Super Tuesday primaries in the South to help a Southern moderate candidate like Al Gore win the nomination. That failed, of course. But in 1992, Bill Clinton managed to win the Democratic Party nomination, even as he sister soldiered the Democratic Party's grassroots base. If anyone thinks there isn't a generation gap between people my age and people who are in college today, just ask undergraduates if they know who Sister Soldier was. The DLC takeover wasn't anti-democratic. In many ways, it gave a broader and more representative cross-section of Democrats a voice in the nominating process. But it was at least partly anti-activist. And so for us, who were in college when Clinton got elected, our heroes were people like George Stephanopoulos, or James Carville and Paul Begala, former congressional aides, political consultants, they were the ones who had brought the Democrats back to power. And back then, too, like Vietnam and like during today, and like Iraq today, these political shifts took place against the backdrop of war. If Gene Picornis were shaped by watching the Democratic Party take America into Vietnam, we were shaped by the Gulf War, which, most Ameri which, which Washington Democrats and our liberal professors had opposed because they thought it was another Vietnam. But it turned out not to be, and neither were Bosnia and Kosovo. In fact, after a while, it became for us a little frightening to contemplate what, what would have happened had we not fought those wars. And that's why I think you'll find on balance that politically active liberals who came of age when I, do, in the, I did in the early 1990s are a bit more instinctively supportive of military force than our baby boom elders, as well as the liberals a half generation younger of this new blog generation, for whom the formative experience is, is Iraq. It might have been 9-11, but it's clearly Iraq. 
My point is that as a result of our experience, we didn't instinctively view the Democratic Party's activist base as either unfailingly correct on the big issues, nor very good at winning elections. We also didn't have the formative experience of seeing our government mislead us, which the Vietnam and the Iraq generations have now clearly had. Of course, conservatives in the 1990s had that experience with Bill Clinton, but that wasn't the experience for us. For us, the Democratic Party in Washington, the insiders, had done pretty well. We wanted them to continue and continue to make the country better. All of which brings me to this new generation, the half generation younger than me, the one that I think Teddy White would have understood so well. For this generation of liberals, the defining event is clearly the Iraq War, but not only the Iraq War, it is the fact that insiders in the Democratic Party, the policy wonks, the political consultants, the very people we cheered in our college dorm rooms in 1992, largely backed the Iraq War and thus betrayed them. Those people told the party's grassroots base, which was highly skeptical, to back the war because it would turn out well, like the Gulf War, and because opposing it would be politically disastrous, just as it had been politically disastrous for an earlier generation of Democrats like Sam Nunn, who had opposed the Iraq, who had opposed the Gulf War, and therefore seen their political amb ambitions shattered. But of course, the war has not turned out well, and it is not as it didn't for Hubert Humphrey. It has not even won the Democrats' power. The Democrats lost in 2002 and lost again in 2004. And so I think, again, you are seeing what you saw in 1972. The pendulum, having shifted in, is now shifting again out. And I think you can actually date the very moment that this happened, the very moment that the pendulum, which had been shifting from outsiders to insiders in the Democratic Party, started shifting again from insiders to outsiders. It was February 21, 2003, when Howard Dean, who was then virtually unknown, went in front of the Democratic National Committee's winter meeting. And Dean's riff went something like this. All the other candidates, interestingly, all the other candidates were training their attacks on George W. Bush. What made Howard Dean's speech significant was that he trained his attacks largely on the Democratic Party in Washington itself. His riff went, what I want to know is why the Democrats in Washington are supporting the Iraq War. What I want to know is why the Democrats in Washington are supporting tax cuts, and on and on like this. And at a certain point, the crowd of Democratic activists started chanting back, we want to know too. That was the moment at which, at which power, which had been shifting in the Democratic Party, I think, ever since 19, the 1980s, from the outside in, began to shift again from the inside out. And from there, of course, Howard Dean experienced this meteoric rise. And it, like in 1972, it wasn't only because of war. It was because of war and a change in the way that campaigns were run. This time, it wasn't because change in the party rules. It was because of the internet. The internet did for Howard Dean what the change in party rules between 1968 and 1972 had done for George McGovern. It created a huge opportunity for a grassroots, decentralized, activist campaign to run against party insiders and to rewrite the rules of presidential politics. And I think... It's clearly done that. Howard Dean lost the battle for the nomination, but he's won the war, or he's at least winning the war, for the soul of the Democratic Party. When party insiders tried to put their candidates earlier this year in as, Democratic, as head of the Democratic Party, they were defeated by this surge of new internet activists, many of them like Daily Coast, the website, or MyDD.com, or MoveOn.org, with close ties to the Dean campaign. So what we are seeing, I think, is, is a new generation in the Democratic Party, a post-Clinton generation. The, the children of Bill Clinton are being pushed aside by the children of Howard Dean. Uh, and if the Democrats win big in 2006, which I think is, is quite likely, I think what you will see is, those, is that those Democrats have an identity which is fundamentally different from the Democrats, the new Democrats who were elected in the 1990s. After Gary Hart won in 1974, McGovern's campaign manager, he famously said, we are not just a bunch of little Hubert Humphreys. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see the Democrats who win in 2006 say something similar about the Clintons and the new Democrats of the 1990s. We are not them. We have been shaped by a fundamentally different set of forces. And as in the 1970s, part of the reason that these people will be so different is that this shift in power in the Democratic Party from the inside out is coinciding with other large structural changes in American politics. Again, changes that echo the changes of the early 1970s. Political scientists sometimes talk about extrovert and introvert uh, cycles in American history, periods where America is more optimistic about its ability to shape the world and periods where, where America is less optimistic. I think you can see Vietnam as beginning an introvert cycle that ended with the Gulf War. 
Um, and I think that extrovert cycle, you remember, even Ronald Reagan, considered this great foreign policy hawk, was never willing to send American troops to Central America. It was a period where America was very suspicious of sending American troops abroad. Starting with the Gulf War, I think you saw the beginning of an extrovert, uh, an extrovert cycle. Uh, starting with Iraq, going through Bill Clinton's military interventions in the 1990s, and now culminating in Iraq. And I think starting around, starting this year, we're starting to see that pendulum shift again, that we're moving to a more introvert cycle, that public opinion is shifting, people are becoming more focused on domestic concerns. And this, is having a, this will have a very powerful effect on this new generation of Democrats, this Dean generation, this post-New Democrat generation that I think we're starting to see being born. The other thing that tends to happen in these introvert cycles is that Congress reestablishes its power. That happened very powerfully in the mid-1970s as a reaction against Vietnam and Watergate and the imperial presidency. And I think you're going to start to see it in the coming years as well. The Harriet Myers defeat may in fact be the first sign of a real reassertion of congressional prerogative, which you tend to see at these introvert moments in American political history. And all of this is shaping the character, it seems to me, of the new ki kind of liberals, the post-Clinton generation that I think we're seeing emerging over the, next, over the next couple of elections. And let me just try to say, in closing, a word about what the identity of these people is, I think. At first glance, they may seem highly ideological. This may seem like a massive shift to the left in the kind of caricatured way that we think about the McGovern campaign. But although there are clearly very dovish elements in this new internet world, I actually think that may be, at least for right now, a mistaken way to understand what's happening. And here again, I, I go back to Teddy White. Pokorny, he wrote, has no stomach for martyrdom. The McGovern activists were not the new left. They may have looked like the new left to many people, but in fact, they are people who had survived the 1960s and stayed in politics. They were people who, in, in their view, saw McGovern as actually a fairly mainstream moderate candidate, a mild-mannered, long-serving senator with a, with a heroic war record, deeply religious. Of course, of course, they were against the war, but in a way, that fundamental litmus test freed them to be very pragmatic and to focus on tactics uh, in, in, their, in the election. And I think that is what really connects them to this new generation that you see today. What's striking to me about this new generation that you're seeing emerging on the internet is how focused they are on tactics, how focused they are on process, how quickly they assume that what's good for the Democratic Party is what's good for liberalism. The fusing, uh, almost in a single intellectual step, of what the Democratic Party needs to do to win elections in 2006 and what liberalism should mean. And it seems to me there is the great danger, not the danger that this that we, as conservatives sometimes say, that we are seeing this gigantic shift to the left, but in fact, that we are seeing something more akin to what happened in the mid-1970s with the generation of neoliberals that came out of the 60s and were elected in large numbers in 1974 and that you can associate Jimmy Carter with in 1976. A kind of a focus on tactics, an inability to create an ideological vision that replaced the Cold War liberalism that died in Vietnam. A focus a belief in a focus on problem solving, uh, on as Michael Dukakis, who was elected first in 1974, said, a focus on competence, not ideology. The, the achievement, I think, of the Clinton and the DLC generation was, in fact, to think about first principles, to think about the relationship between state and civil society, to think about the ability of the market to achieve traditional liberal ends. I think that's fundamentally what distinguished them from the neoliberals like Gary Hart and Michael Dukakis who had emerged in the 1970s and 80s. And my fear is that the new blogosphere generation, the one that's emerging today, the children of Howard Dean, are in fact so focused on organizational and tactical questions about how the Democratic Party can frame its message, that they're not focused nearly enough in fact on what the Democratic Party and what liberals believe. That they, have, that they are so tied in to the party structure itself that they have lost, that they don't spend nearly enough time thinking about, in fact, what Democrats believe. That they tend to assume that liberals and Democrats know what they believe and therefore should focus on how they can package it for the country, when in fact that first step is not accurate at all. That liberals and Democrats don't know what they believe and that taking that second step, even if it wins 
an election in 2006 or an election in 2008 could produce a kind of a false dawn equivalent to the one that the Democratic Party saw in the mid-1970s, in which the Democrats actually do take power, but haven't given enough serious thought to what they believe to know what to do with that power when they have it. Let me just end with a word about what this means for liberal journalism. Um, because one of the striking things about the bloggers is that they are not only activists, but they are journalists too. The blogs, the blogs blur that division. And their stress on tactics, on winning elections rather than on first principles, I think is bad for liberal opinion writing. The bloggers are helping create a journalistic culture with too much focus on how Democrats win political battles, too quick an assumption that what helps Democrats win is what liberalism should mean, too much interest in the short term. And it's producing cramped, small bore, predictable, and perhaps worst of all, dull political writing. It's not what liberals need today. It's not what opinion journalism needs today. It's not even what the Democratic Party needs today. And I don't think Teddy White would have approved. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. By Kennedy School tradition, uh, Peter will respond to questions uh, from any of you in the audience. We have microphones here, there, up here, and up here. If you would line up uh, for, for at the microphones to ask your questions uh, and also identify yourself, and if I may ask you to uh, limit one to a customer and also remember it's a question, not a speech that we are seeking. As you're taking your positions, may I ask the first question? Who is the candidate in 2008 for this new generation of Democrats? Um, well, I, I think the, the one person who it's not is Hillary Clinton. Um, I think, uh, and, and I say that as someone who, who, who admires Hillary Clinton and admires what she's tried to do. It seems to me that what Hillary Clinton has done is taken a look at the post 9-11 world where, where the Republicans created this huge advantage on national security, and people didn't think the Democratic Party was tough enough. And she said, I've seen this before. We faced exactly the same issue with crime, where the Democratic Party was not considered tough enough, and we, did, we took a series of steady, methodical steps that worked incredibly well to alleviate that problem over the course of the 1980s and into the 1990s. And it seems to me, if you look at what Hillary Clinton has done, being a very set, steadfast supporter of the Iraq War, supporting the 87 billion, getting on the Armed Services Committee, that's exactly what she's done. She has replayed her husband's scenario on crime, but on the military. But in, it seems to me in a very cruel twist of fate for her and her political ambitions. That, entire, that very strategy, which was, which was based on the idea that Republicans would have this huge advantage on national security as they had had on crime that Democrats had to alleviate, has completely collapsed. The remarkable story of 2005, the last year since George W. Bush won the presidency, is that his advantage on foreign policy has basically collapsed. Even on the war on terrorism, he can bar barely get 50%. And so what Hillary Clinton, who was focusing all of her, her political energies on how she could appeal to people to her center and her right, seems to me now has this enormous problem on her political left, that Hillary Clinton was following a political strategy designed by her husband for a time when the Democratic Party activist base was willing to accept almost anything, was in a, uh, in, was, was, is in a very unradical mood at a time when, in fact, the Democratic Party's activist base has now become very radicalized. Um, and, and the problem that she now has is that as compelling a candidate as she is, she's going to have to go to event after event after event and answer the same question that sucked so much oxygen out of the air every time John Kerry and John Edwards tried to answer it, which was, if you don't like George W. Bush so much, how come you followed him into war in Iraq? Uh, which I should say parenthetically, that is the editor of the New Republic and someone who supported the Iraq war, a qu is, is a question that I give a lot of thought to myself. Um, but I don't have to win the Iowa caucuses. And um, uh, it seems to me um, there, the, 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 the notion that people had a couple years ago that the space would be on Hillary Clinton's right is no longer accurate. The, the space is on Hillary Clinton's left. And the question will be, will be, is it Russ Feingold or Wesley Clark or John Kerry or Al Gore? The most interesting, I think, horse race, over, it seems to me, over the next year or two will be who emerges as the darling of the liberal activist base to run against Hillary Clinton from her left. And I think that candidacy, particularly if someone can make the argument that they actually were against the Iraq War and say what the liberal activist base wants, but 
can actually appeal to the country more because of various cultural factors actually could be a very, very potent candidacy. Peter, um, right after the election, you wrote a, a very good article. In fact, Alex re referred to it in the introduction, uh, advocating a muscular liberalism in which you hearkened back to Roosevelt, to Truman, to Kennedy. Um, your remarks tonight seem to move away from that, uh, recognizing that the, uh, the followers of Howard Dean don't agree with that position. Um, have you changed your mind since you wrote the article in November right after the election uh, advocating a muscular liberalism? No, no, not at all. Um, I think that the, the great challenge will be how to convince there is an enormous amount of idealism, it seems to me, in the liberal wing of the Democratic Party today. It seems to me the great challenge for people who are concerned about foreign policy and concerned about the, the war on terror and who believe that, that while that phrase may be wrong, that something like that exists and represents a very grave threat to liberal values around the world and to America, is to convince those people that in fact this is, a, is, a, this is an arena in which their idealism should express itself. That they should not, they should not, because George W. Bush speaks about freedom and democracy, therefore take a position that in fact they are the new realists. They are the ones who don't really care what happens in Egypt or happens in Saudi Arabia. And it seems to me there is a language that is in the liberal tradition, which is dramatically different than George W. Bush's language, but it's also dramatically different from Brent Scowcroft or Henry Kissinger's realist language upon which liberals can draw. This is really the, the heart of the book that I'm trying to write. And the it goes something like this. America is a great country and is capable of great things in the world precisely because it recognizes that it is capable of evil. This is, I think, the, the, the great lesson for me that comes out of Cold War liberalism from Reinhold Niebuhr, kind of passed on through Arthur Schlesinger. The understanding, in fact, that America is an exceptional country precisely because we recognize that we are not inherently better than anybody else, but that that constant recognition is in fact what is at the heart of the country's greatness. As opposed to, the, to George W. Bush's tradition, which I think you can trace back to someone like John Foster Dulles or even James Burnham, which basically says America is inherently good. American power is always good. That doesn't need to be proved, doesn't need to be earned. It simply needs to be asserted. And anyone around the world who suggests that we are morally fallible is anti-American. I think within that tradition, I think you can build a kind of a language for, for how liberalism, in fact, can make America a greater country by promoting freedom around the world in a very different way than George W. Bush does. Um, but I think for it to work, it's going to have to be a language that appeals to liberals. Uh, and I think it's going to have to be a language that convinces liberals that, in fact, liberal values are at stake. That they're, not that they're doing this so they can win some swing vote somewhere, because they may be able to win in 2006 and 2008 without this language at all, but that convinces them they need to believe in it because it's in their best moral tradition. Hi. Um, you criticized... Oh, sorry? If you would identify... Oh, I'm Ganesh Sitaraman. Uh, I was a graduate of the college, and I'm at the law school right now. Um, you criticized the uh, bloggers for being a little bit too concerned with tactics rather than ideas. Um, as somebody in the kind of half generation below you who, who grew up, I guess, with the experience of, of Clinton, not of 1992, but of 96 through 2000, uh, I feel like our generation is very concerned that the New Democrats were too concerned with tactics. Um, do you feel like people who are centrists now are actually doing the, aside from yourself, are actually doing the kind of big ideas work, or is nobody doing it at all, the, la the kind of bloggers or the centrists? Well, I think, that's, I think you've made a very important point, and I think that one of the, um, I think one of the important arguments to make, uh, you know, we have Elaine Kmark in the audience, so I'm, I'm not, uh, there are people who could do this better than me, is actually, is I think to defend Clintonism to some degree from that charge. It's true that there were lots of zigs and, zigs and zags uh, uh, during Bill Clinton's presidency. Um, but it seemed to me there was a coherent set of ideas that underlaid it. Um, the idea that traditional liberal ends didn't always need to mean government programs, that you could use market principles, in fact, to get to the ends that liberals wanted. The recognition that civil society was an incredibly important vehicle for achieving traditional liberal goals, not only the state. 
uh, and the recognition that it was not illiberal to ask people who received from government to show responsibility. It seemed to me those were all incredibly important principles. And the outcomes, it seemed to me, particularly in retrospect, look pretty good. Uh, I think that, um, in fact, if you look not at whether Bill Clinton managed to create large new government programs, but if you look at the central liberal question, I think, ever since the 1970s in terms of domestic policy, which is, did life for people, for working class people and poor people actually get better when it had been stagnating or getting worse since the early 1970s? It did in, the, in those very last few years of the Clinton administration, partly because of his very wise fiscal policy. So I think that to some degree, um, that, that part of this effort needs to start with the defense of Clintonism. Obviously, one would have hoped that it would have gone further, and, and, and many people hope that, that you would have had essentially a third Clinton term in which you could have put some of those things into, into practice. But I think my own personal view is that that's a misreading of the Clinton years and therefore leads you down a kind of intellectual blind alley. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if my questions... Oh, um, I'm Reg McCain of the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. And... I'm wondering if um, you've given us an adequate idea of what you think are the domestic policy ideas of the, um, the children of G Dean generation. Um, clearly, the Democratic Party <coughs> is split on foreign policy, uh, but there must be some, you must have some impre further impression of the domestic ideas among the what you call the liberal blogosphere, uh, other than some, um, acceptance of what Clinton accomplished domestically? Yeah. Um, I think that there were two questions there. One is kind of what the liberal blogosphere believes on domestic policy and what I would suggest that people believe. Um, uh, on the, on the first, I think what's striking about the liberal blogosphere is actually its fiscal conservatism. I think that one of the ways in these terms left and right get confused, it seems to me, is that there's the Democratic Party, it seems to me, um, has been for quite a long time been moving to the left on foreign policy and on culture, but been moving to the right on economics, uh, which is not surprising if you think about the fact that, that blue-collar people have been moving out of the Democratic Party and white-collar people have been moving into the Democratic Party. So that uh, many of the people who may be, may be considered quite far to the left on foreign policy or on cultural policy, I think, are actually very wedded to a balanced budget. I think it, it's, it seems to me the, the constituency for the arguments that someone like Richard Gephardt used to make which basically say we don't really need a balanced budget because we need to stress economic investment more. I think that the constituency for that, for that ideology is very weak in the Democratic Party. What I think the Democratic Party hasn't done, and what I think the liberal blogosphere needs to, hasn't done, um, but I think is the great challenge, is for the Democratic Party to, to try to answer some of the questions that someone like Jacob Hacker has, I think, laid out so well, which is to say, in the midst of a period in which the middle class in America looks like it's basically in the same place as it was in the 1970s, it's li the life of the average middle class American has gotten dramatically more difficult. That the American welfare state, which used to be a welfare state in which corporations, more than the government, provided the things on which people relied. Corporations provided health care, they provided economic stability, they provided fixed pensions. American, American corporations, under the threat of international pressure and technological change, have retreated from providing many of those services, and the government hasn't stepped in. And what it has produced is a dramatic rise in economic insecurity, even for Americans who at first glance don't seem that badly off. So there has been, for instance, a dramatic rise in bankruptcies, largely as the result of, of, of health care costs in the middle class. That there has been that many Americans, even when their income may not may seem reasonably high, are really one bad turn, whether it be a health care event or a losing of their job, away from economic disaster. And that the central it seems to me the central focus for the Democratic Party and for liberals has to be how to respond to that new reality, how to deal with the fact that there's actually a kind of a hidden economic desperation, even in the middle class, even to some degree up into the upper middle class, because there is so little economic security in America today. And I think that seems to me the central question to which liberals need to address themselves on the domestic policy side. Yes. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, I'll frame my question. Uh, my name is uh, Porico Mali. Um, I'll frame my question just in terms of what you, 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 you said. Um, you talk about uh, economic desperation among the middle class uh, Americans. And uh, I would like you to take 
your ideas of liberalism as you would apply it to dealing with that, but to put it in the larger context of a liberalism that would recognize the economic desperation of most of the rest of the world, uh, of the developing world, uh, mostly because of American economic policies, uh, which have run these incredibly huge deficits, which uh, Alan Greensberg has said are, in the, are unsustainable. We hear the word again and again and again and again. They're unsustainable. Everything is unsustainable. If, if you had the ideal candidate coming in, running for president, developing a platform now, a liberal, uh, what would your advice be to him in terms of uh, getting out of Iraq, in terms of, or just a war in Iraq, in terms of the equation of uh, human rights uh, with uh, provisions in uh, homeland security, the erosion, the erosion of... of, of these, are, these are a lot of uh, different questions to keep no, track yeah, of. With, uh, with, no, no, with, I'm trying to find, I don't know, we've heard the word liberal, 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 liberal. We haven't yet heard one thing about what a liberal should stand for, your very point. And what economic policies to deal with the desperation of the middle classes can be developed in view of, sorry, just in view of the, 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 the deficits that have to be dealt with, okay? Why don't I, why don't I, why don't I try to respond um, to the international dimension of, of your question? Um, uh, because I think, you're, I, think, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think that one of the, the themes that you see in conservative thinking throughout the Cold War was the, was, the continu was the continual assertion that, in fact, communism had nothing to do with poverty, that, that, that global poverty and communism were completely unrelated, and that when liberals tried to suggest that, in fact, one of the, one of the answers to communism was provide economic hope for people, that that was a way of apologizing for communism. And I think you have seen a similar kind of claim made since 9-11 on the right about, about terrorism and about jihadism, the suggestion that, in fact, because the 9-11 because the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia, therefore, poverty is not part of this story at all. There is a willingness, for which I think conservatives deserve credit, uh, to recognize that, in fact, a lack of political freedom may be part of the story. And I think that came into the conservative movement under Ronald Reagan. It wasn't really there before. But there is still a, 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 an utter denial to, to, of, of the idea that, in fact, economic desperation may, in fact, be part of the story. And, and a very simple-minded suggestion that because Saudi Arabia, for instance, is not a desperately poor country, that in fact the roots of jihadism have nothing to do with global poverty, where in fact Saudi Arabia's GDP per capita has dropped by half since the 1980s. Uh, it is a society in economic freefall, um, where you have vast numbers of people coming out of college every year, trained to, trained to do nothing at all, sitting around and dreaming of a kind of purified Islam, in the same way you're seeing in large parts of the Middle East, that even though people in the Middle East may have college degrees, some of them, uh, those college degrees are not equipping them to do anything. They're not in societies where, in fact, that, that, can, that can absorb these large numbers of people graduating from college and provide them with any kind of economic opportunity. That there is a reason that you've seen very few jihadists coming out of India, for instance, a country where, which, in fact, has some degree of economic hope and economic promise. And that the, the conservative suggestion that, that trade alone can answer that is simple-minded, that in fact what, we, what, what, economic, what economists have learned in recent years is that, is that the key is using aid as a vehicle for in fact bringing countries into the world economy. I don't think that the answer is for countries to stay out of the world economy. I think the answer is to bring the Muslim world into the world economy through uh, 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 through exactly what the 9-11 Commission asked for, for, through exactly what the Arab Human Development Court asked for, which is a kind of a massive commitment to the linkage of educational opportunity in the Muslim world to economic engagement in the global economy. And I think that that has to be kind of part of the liberal story in a way that it really hasn't been, except for in very marginal ways under the Bush administration. Thank you. So, two more questions. Hi, my name is Jayma Adams. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School and co-chair of the Kennedy School Democratic Caucus. 
And we are trying to facilitate this conversation um, on what do Democrats stand for? What, what are our values? I'd like your opinion on leveraging the particular kinds of tools and resources we have available here on how to be leaders um, in helping the Democratic Party define itself. Um, it seems to me the, the, the biggest problem that the Democratic Party has um, is that it doesn't take conservatives seriously enough. There is a, there is a it seems to me, um, a very long-term kind of patronizing view, in fact, that, uh, that because there are not that many conservatives at places like Harvard, by and large, that in fact there's not a lot of serious, important intellectual work going on amongst conservatives and that liberals are the ones in control of ideas. I think that really has not been the case for a very long time. I think if you look at, uh, if you look at what the conservative movement did starting in the 1950s, it put an enormous amount of energy and effort into ideas. Um, and, uh, and it's paid off very handsomely. Um, what's striking to me about conservatives, uh, uh, if you talk to young conservatives, is they know their intellectual history. They know their intellectual lineage extremely well. And liberals, by and large, have very little sense of it whatsoever. If you ask, if you ask your average 24-year-old conservative, who were the people who founded National Review? Who, were the founder, you know, who was Frank Meyer? They will know. They will tell you. They will, they will go into detail about the debates between liber libertarians and traditionalists and the fusion that was created in the 1950s. You find that in my experience amongst them. Maybe because you know, they don't have much else better to do. But for whatever reason, um, uh, for whatever reason, I think it is, it, it is the source of conservative power. And that liberals make a, a serious mistake. Yes, of course, it helps conservatives a lot that they have a big kind of corporate K Street infrastructure that funds all these things, yes. But liberals have plenty of money out there to fund themselves. It's, it's, it's a complete misnomer to think there isn't liberal money on the liberal side. They're swimming with money. The question is whether liberals are going to invest in the kind of effort that the business community invested in, in the 1950s and 60s and 1970s, to in fact produce the ideas that now liberals are desperately battling against, like Social Security privatization, like medical savings accounts, uh, or whether liberals will fall into the trap of thinking that the only real core source of conservative strength is the fact that they're willing to play so nastily in these presidential campaigns and that they raise so much money and that that's all liberals need to do. I think if liberals think that what they need to do, in fact, is just get their own version of the swift boat veterans, they will completely misunderstand the reason that they've been losing and the reason that conservatives have been so successful. My name is Lou Carty. I'm a first year master's candidate here at the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, my question for you is building on the previous question in a debate we've been having here, which is uh, one of the principal uh, objections to, to liberalism and democratic liberalism has, has been that it's been elitist and that it's, uh, in particular, the Democratic Party and the DNC has had this sort of top-down thing where at the top we develop these great elitist ideas and then the masses don't want to support them because they're not in line with what they're thinking nearly as much as Republican ideals are. So I guess my question for you is, uh, should the DNC still have a, a kind of an overarching power over this, or should we be just identifying a general liberalism, which then can be applied at the grassroots levels uh, in whatever way is deemed necessary by the particular candidate? Well, I think as a practical matter, these things tend to, the message tends to come less out of the DNC than out of a presidential candidate. Every four years, a kind of presidential candidate has the opportunity to kind of define a message that then either really catches on for liberals, as I think Bill Clinton's did, or, or doesn't catch on, doesn't really leave you very much to work with, for instance, as John Kerry's did. I mean, conservatives have really been kind of feeding off of you know, Ronald Reagan's campaigns ever since uh, because there was a lot of nourishment there. Uh, so to some degree, you naturally look to, to presidential candidates, but then you have to think about who informs those presidential candidates. How do they come, how do they come up with those ideas? I guess, it seems to me, liberals have, had this, have been cowed um, in, in recent years, particularly by the feeling that they're not religious enough. Uh, by, this, by this sense that they've been kind of shocked into this awareness that in fact they live in an extremely religious country um, and that they by and large, and this polls show that self-described liberals are less religious, um, and, and this has produced this great sense of insecurity uh, and I think a lot of e awkward efforts to kind of find religious language and, put reling and throw religious language in and use religious, deploy religious language to make arguments that liberals in fact would be making anyway. Um, that seems to me to be, in my view, a mistake. It seems to me that, that the, the problem that liberalism has is 
a lack of conviction about what liberalism is and a lack of authenticity when liberals go out and make their arguments. And then when you go out, if you're not a particularly religious person, if you don't naturally talk in religious terms, if you then go out and try to throw a lot of religious language into your rhetoric, uh, quoting the Bible, well, first of all, if you're quoting the Bible to people who know the Bible, um, it's a dangerous thing because they may ask you, ask you questions about it. You, you know, um, it seems to me it's a, it's a deeply patronizing thing to, do, thing to do. If you don't naturally uh, pocket your references to poverty by, by quoting the New Testament, then don't do it um, because people who knew, know know the New Testament better than you um, will in fact catch you out on it. It seems to me that, I don't think, that it seems to me there is, the problem that liberals face is that religion uh, has become for conservatives a way of, of talking about how we're in it together, how we have values that are larger than the market, how in fact what we have lost as a society. Um, uh, and, and that liberals need to find a language to address those things, but I don't think it's a religious language. I actually think it is more of a nationalist language. I think that if you look back to liberal tradition, if you look back, for instance, to John F. Kennedy's presidential campaign in 1960, and if you look at John McCain's presidential campaign in 2000, very interestingly enough, which had a lot in common with Kennedy's campaign in 1960, what you see is, what you can draw from those is a kind of a nationalist language, which says, which says in some ways some of the same kind of things that you hear from the Christian right, that we, we are too materialist, that we have become too soft, that we, are not at, that we have become an effete society that is not willing to, to go after and try to do hard, difficult things together. I don't think that language has to be framed religiously. I think it can be framed in terms of nationalism. And I think that is the better option for liberals because I think it's more true to what liberals themselves really believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you know, may notice that uh, Peter is sitting beside his wife who is expecting a baby in January, and he told me before we began tonight that he expects that to mature his age is the way he looks considerably. So, uh, I'd like to remind you that tomorrow morning we will use Peter Beinert's lecture as a point of departure for further discussion by Peter and a very distinguished panel. You're all invited to come. I encourage you to come. In addition to Peter, the panelists include John Leo, a national political columnist based at U.S. News & World Report, Tom Patterson, the Bradley Professor of Government and the Press here at the Kennedy School, Dorothy Rabinowitz, a member of the Wall Street Journal's editorial board and a frequent commentator on the media, Jean Shaheen, Director of Harvard's Institute of Politics, former Governor of New Hampshire and John, Chair of John Kerry's presidential campaign, Michael Tomaski, executive editor of the American Prospect, another great liberal political magazine, and David Willman, this year's Nyan Prize winner. In other words, an all-star lineup. We'll gather on the fifth floor of the Taubman Building, which is the building out here, uh, at 8.30 for a continental breakfast, and we will begin the conversation at 9. It will go on until 11. I urge you to attend if you can. I think you'll find it's very interesting. My thanks once again to Peter Beinert, and my congratulations to David Willman. Thank you all for joining us, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.